Okay. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the meeting of the Mayor and Council of Princeton, June 14th, 2021. Happy Flag Day. Can we have the uh, statement on the notice of meeting? Notice of this meeting was provided in accordance with the requirement of the Open Public Meeting Act and state regulations governing remote public meetings, including the time, date, and location of the meeting and clear and concise instructions to the public for accessing the meeting and making comments. In addition, the agenda and all related materials were posted electronically and made available to the public on Princeton's meeting portal in advance of the meeting. Thank you very much. Can we have the roll call, please? Yes, Mayor. Ms. Perone Lambros? Here. Ms. Niedergang? Here. Mr. Cohen? Ms. Fraga? Here. Mr. Williamson? Here. Ms. Sachs? Here. Mayor Frieda. Here. Okay, we have two changes to the agenda that I just wanna mention and get approval on. Uh, the one is in the current agenda package, resolution number seven, which deals with the purchase of a vehicle uh, is gonna be removed from the agenda and postponed. And there's also in addition to the agenda, another resolution where we need a, uh, and it's time sensitive, that's why it's being added now. Uh, but we actually uh, did not have someone that could sign our recycling tonnage grant. So we're reaching out to Lawrence Township and doing a resolution to allow uh, someone from Lawrence Township to sign our tonnage grant. Okay. All right. Um, first up on the agenda is going to be approval of this. Excuse me, Mayor. Are we yes. going to have an, a motion to? Yeah, thank you, right? That's, what, that's where I started and didn't end up. <laughs> Eve, thank you very much for- I, I move to amend the agenda. Thank you, Eve. Michelle, let's get the second. Okay. Any questions? Yeah. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, that's everybody, aye. Thank, thank you. you very much. Um, approval of minutes. We have two sets of minutes. Leticia? I'm going to move that we approve both the February 9th and February 11th meetings. Thank you. Eve, is that a second? Yes, please. Thank you. Any questions on the minutes? No. It, no? Okay. If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. That's everybody. Thank you very much. Um, announcements and reports. Do we have any? Uh, Leticia? Yes, just very uh, quick. Uh, one, there's some feedback. One is uh, regarding uh, um, the permit parking task force, following uh, community meetings, and then uh, the comments that we heard at our last council meeting, uh, the task force uh, w uh, went back and taking into consideration some of the concerns and, and comments that we heard we are making some tweaks in the process of making some tweaks to the proposal, but we're also working on, there's already uh, on the municipal uh, website, uh, a web page under the BCC's page uh, that provides uh, information regarding the work of the task force. And eventually we're working on providing some uh, thanks to David, uh, some visuals that will be able to demonstrate a side-by-side -side comparison of what the existing parking regime is and what uh, is entailed in um, the recommendations that we're making. Uh, we do intend to have uh, more community meetings to solicit um, uh, additional input, uh, including uh, it is our hope uh, intent to have a community-wide meeting from um, all neighborhoods that would be impacted uh, as we did at the beginning when the task force was first formed two years ago, we had a community-wide town hall meeting. And so uh, we want to do that again. And I think it would be very, I, I think some of us uh, have agreed that 
if not all, that it would be very beneficial to have residents from the ne different neighborhoods hear each other as to what their challenges are uh, in parking in their neighborhood. And because ultimately, you know, one of our goals is to provide uh, uh, parking, you know, have, have equity in, in parking in, in our different neighborhoods. Because right now it's, it's not an equitable system. So uh, that's one thing that we'll be working on. And so uh, we haven't yet determined when these community meetings will take place. Uh, but stay tuned, but also, like I mentioned, the webpage that where we'll be providing information and continuously updating it. It's under the municipal uh, website under the, the page that's at the BCCs. I have one additional announcement slash report. Uh, earlier this uh, month, I had the opportunity uh, to officiate a wedding for the first time. Uh, it was a really uh, wonderful opportunity. I really and especially uh, when I learned that the couple, uh, their first language is Spanish. So I was able to conduct the ceremony in both English and Spanish, and they were thrilled. Uh, I also um, offered them the opportunity that instead of doing it in the clerk's office, that we could do uh, the ceremony outdoors. And we actually uh, went to uh, Monument Hall because less trees, less cicadas, no interruptions. And it was very lovely. Uh, also, they appreciate it because they were able to have more friends and family uh, present. Uh, and I mention it because uh, I don't know if everybody's aware that whenever uh, we, uh, mayor or council president officiates a wedding, the fees uh, go towards our human services emergency fund. So anybody, uh, out Princeton resident, or they don't have to be a Princeton resident. Anybody in, uh, wishing to be married in Princeton, keep that in mind. Also keep in mind, that I know I, I, as long as it's within the boundaries of Princeton, would accommodate uh, uh, the location where they want to have their, their ceremony. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I think Eve was next and then Mia. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I have uh, a number of things. Uh, first, um, the Cannabis Task Force is going to hold its first community meeting uh, next week, June 23rd at 6 p.m. via Zoom. So you'll be able to get that, uh, that Zoom link on the municipal website. Uh, we're looking to hear input from the community uh, about uh, uh, licensing a cannabis dispensary in town. So please attend and make your voice heard. Uh, I wanted to just update everyone on some things that the Environmental Commission is working on, uh, one of which is a time of listing energy audit. And what that would be is at the time a property comes up for sale, a uh, property owner would be required to do uh, an inexpensive energy audit. The idea is that it would then allow people to compare, uh, similar to buying a washing machine where it's a refrigerator where it tells you what the energy load would be, that this would be some attempt to compare so you knew before buying a house what the energy costs might be. So that's something that they're working on and hoping it'll come to council for a brief discussion and some guidance in August or September. Uh, PC has also been working on revising the green building checklist, which the planning office uses to uh, encourage builders and developers to make sustainable green choices as they uh, plan their, their uh, developments, their buildings. Um, PEC also heard and endorsed a series of ordinance recommendations uh, concerning health, safety, and noise concerns presented by the Sustainable Landscaping Working Group. And those recommendations will be presented to council for discussion at our next meeting. This will not be uh, an ordinance uh, presentation, but just a report from the Sustainable Landscaping Working Group. Uh, from the library uh, tomorrow night, uh, June 15th at 7 p.m. on Zoom, the library's teen advisory board will be presenting, uh, I read this book, in which members of TAB uh, talk about books they've read in the past year that have 
made a significant impact on them. And I've heard this is a wonderful event. You can uh, register on the library website. Uh, I plan to be there. And the library's summer reading program, Reading Colors Your World, also begins tomorrow. And that's something, again, if you register for that, whether you're a kid or an adult, you're eligible to win prizes from local merchants. Um, and that's all I have for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Mia. Thank you. Um, first, for those who don't know yet, the Franklin Task Force uh, meeting is going to be on the 30th, uh, June 30th at 7 p.m. It's a specially noticed council meeting, and that um, involves uh, the recommendations from the task force that was meeting to um, uh, talk about design guidelines and, and they've put together a report. There are a number of different subcommittees from that task force who um, will be presenting at the meeting and I'm sure it will be a very um, lively discussion. And um, so look forward to seeing um, those who are interested in that site on June 30th. Um, also, I want to mention that yesterday I spent a couple hours visiting with um, a senior resident of, uh, of one of our senior housing um, uh, uh, projects. And um, she was very articulate in um, conveying her concern about how many of our seniors have been, um, and, I'm, and I'm sure this is across the board of, of seniors in all sorts of, um, uh, throughout the community, how our seniors have, um, like all of us, been, um, uh, you know, very isolated during COVID, um, but um, how it's even more challenging to, to reintegrate into, um, into regular life um, uh, for some of, for many of her, her friends and, and uh, neighbors. And so um, I just want to encourage everyone um, to reach out to your senior neighbors and friends and check in on them and, um, you know, see if you can offer a ride or have an outdoor visit. Um, and the other concern she mentioned was, of course, um, related to transportation. And as many of you know, the freebie bus um, uh, was down during COVID for health reasons, but it also had uh, run through its, its uh, life cycle. And so we don't have that running uh, right now. We are working with a number of different community partners to hopefully come back with a much more um, um, accessible and frequent um, transportation system. But in the meantime, we do need to figure out something for the short term now that uh, I think our health officer is, is going to be allowing that. So we will be coming up with something, I don't know what, but I just want to reassure those who have relied on the freebie um, it, uh, that we, we will be working to replace something in the short term. So um, stay tuned for that. That's it. Thank you, Mia. Michelle and then David. Thank you. Um, so the Community Center Feasibility Task Force will put together an application um, for those uh, uh, residents uh, who would like to volunteer to participate in the task force. Uh, it should be up on the website um, tomorrow. And um, if you're interested at all, uh, please fill it out and let us know um, what your interest is, your background, and we, we're reaching out to the community um, to get your input. This will be a process whereby we are looking at the feasibility of whether or not a community center is needed and then what needs it would be meeting that are not redundant with other opportunities in, in the community. Um, so we're reaching out to um, various uh, um, organizations, community partners, and we'd really very much like to um, have anyone who's interested, please apply. And it'll be Leticia, Dwayne and I um, as your council liaison. So if you have any questions, um, please reach out to us and ask. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. David? Yeah, I have um, <clears throat> three brief reports. Uh, one is just uh, the Flood and Stormwater Committee has been continuing to make good progress. Um, we have put together a request for proposal for a consultant to help with um, studying the idea of a stormwater utility and whether that's appropriate. 
uh, in Princeton. I think that's in um, attorney review and we'll be going out shortly to qualified consultants. Uh, we're also just about done with drafting of the uh, stormwater redevelopment ordinance, which I know members of council are uh, aware of and have been looking forward to um, eagerly. So uh, I would expect that to be coming, be introduced before council within the month. Um, for the, I, I wanna give a brief report uh, as liaison to the Historic Preservation Commission. I know that um, members of council have been receiving correspondence from members of the community uh, about um, helping to preserve uh, some historic houses that are on Prospect Street that are impacted, uh, proposed to come down as part of the university's um, School of Eng Engineering and Applied Sciences uh, application, planning board application. And I just wanna make clear to members of the public that council cannot weigh in on this. This is really a matter for the planning board. Uh, and the applications are coming before the planning board this Thursday evening uh, on the 17th. So if you're interested uh, in sharing your feelings about the, um, the application, that's, that's where you need to um, uh, show up and, and voice your concerns. And then lastly, um, this item is, is shown a little bit further on in the agenda, but I think since I'm giving my reports now, I'll just mention it briefly, which is um, the uh, Pedestrian and Bicycle Advisory Committee passed a resolution uh, calling on um, Mayor and Council, Traffic Safety, and uh, the Traffic uh, Safety Bureau of the Police Department to help with a uh, rather dangerous um, situation that exists at the intersection of G General Johnson Drive and Rosedale Road. Um, there are some wonderful improvements that are planned for this area, uh, but they're part of a Safe Routes to School federally funded project. We know they won't be completed for a couple of years. And as things stand right now, there are many um, students of Johnson Park School who commute or who, who walk or bike to school from the Edgerstone neighborhood, which is on the far side of Greenway Meadows. And they have to cross Ros Rosedale Road uh, in order to get to school. And there's uh, not been a crossing guard in that location for quite a while. As I understand it, partly because uh, Traffic Safety Bureau of Police Department considers it too dangerous to have a civilian volunteer uh, directing or doing the crossing guard work in that location. So, David, David, actually, the crossing guards are not allowed by law to direct traffic. They are only allowed to help with crossing. So, the, understood. The, 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 but, no, I'm just saying the real reason the crossing guard is not used for traffic is because they're not allowed to do it. But that, in, that, that's for the in this particular location, I've been told they're not allowed to cross the students because it's considered too dangerous for a civilian. Uh, okay, I think when we get to the police report, they'll get into that more. But according to the police chief, that's a, an erroneous uh, piece of information that someone gave you. Okay. All right. Well, that's my report. And uh, just wanted to make members of the council and the public aware that um, there are concerns about the safety of crossing in that location. Yeah, okay. Uh, Dwayne was next and then we'll get back to you, Eve, sorry. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Sorry to jump in there, Eve, I saw your hand go up, but <laughs> okay. Uh, just a, a, a couple of things. Uh, the first is um, um, after uh, jumping over a couple of hurdles, uh, we finally got uh, a Princeton graduate student, Matt Mlesko to join the Affordable Housing Board as a third alternate. <laughs> I saw a smile going me his face just now too for that. And uh, so, so glad to have you aboard, Matt. Um, also regarding the uh, Princeton uh, uh, Recreation Department, um, as, as I've been mentioning in the last few meetings, uh, Recreation has, has been doing such a, a great job of providing a very like diverse menu of activities. And, you know, as things are opening up and folks want to get out there and it's, it's great for your physical health, it's great for your mental health. Um, let me mention, I'm going to highlight just some of the, the new additions that have gone up recently. Um, there is the uh, Princeton Empowerment Program uh, open to rising third to sixth grade girls. And this program will encourage girls from various 
various backgrounds and social uh, cliques to come together in a safe place, talk about important life topics and to break down social barriers to encourage girls to embrace who they are and to find out their inner strength to spread kindness, to empower them to be part of a supportive environment or sisterhood amongst themselves and their friends. That's one. Another one is Princeton's, uh, Princeton's head men's basketball coach, Mitch Henderson, is uh, doing a uh, um, two-night summer basketball program. Uh, the last one is the Tots and Shots basketball clinics, clinics and kids running programs. Uh, and these are directed at uh, children from K through uh, fourth grade. And as I mentioned, there's just so many others on there. I would encourage everyone to visit the uh, municipal website and to the uh, Recre Recreation Department's pages on the websites to uh, find out all that's uh, being offered. And uh, that's all I have. Thanks. Thank you, Dwayne. Eve. Uh, yes, I omitted something very important. Uh, thank you, Mia, for your announcement, which reminded me that depending on uh, what happens at the uh, Cannabis Task Force public meeting um, on uh, this coming Wednesday, uh, we are holding time for another council meeting on uh, June 29th, which would be uh, devoted to talking about a possible uh, ordinance allowing uh, cannabis in town. So I'm not 100% sure that will uh, go forward, uh, but uh, just wanted to alert everybody that that is on, on the agenda at this moment. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, just... Um... Two quick things. Uh, Wednesday at noon at Monument Hall, uh, since it's Pride Month, there'll be a raising of the Pride flag at Monument Hall again Wednesday at noon. Uh, just remind people that the two town hall buildings are open all day, um, something we started last week. So if people have business to conduct, uh, both buildings are open. And then just to put a plug out there, if you haven't signed up for the town newsletter that comes out twice a week, please go to the website and do so. There's a lot of great information that comes out twice a week to keep people up to date on everything. Okay, um, Bernie, do you or, um, before we get to the police reports, do you or any other staff you know have any uh, announcements or reports at this time? Uh, Mayor, I don't have anything to add at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so we have two, uh, two police reports and uh, if there's some comment more on Rosedale and General Johnson Road, Lieutenant, now would be the, uh, the time to bring that up. Good evening, Mayor and Council members, and thanks for having me. I'm here to present the uh, April and May police reports. Um, we grouped them together just as a result of the way the calendar and the meeting fell. Uh, that's why both reports were uh, released at the same time. I just want to take a brief minute and just uh, highlight a couple of the things on those reports and some other things that uh, the chief wanted to bring up. The first thing is call volume. Um, you see on the police reports that our call volume is uh, steadily rising as the pandemic is seemingly winding down or maneuvering into a new phase. Moderate sense of normalcy is starting to uh, develop. Our call volume is rising. Uh, we expect this to continue as we move into the summer months. And um, we're not where we were pre-pandemic, but as we move into the summer and, and get further along through the pandemic, we expect those numbers to go up. The uh, second thing is the parking issues. We were requested for increased parking enforcement, uh, specifically on Witherspoon Street. This remains to be a challenge. Our parking enforcement officers have been out there daily providing meticulous watch of this area. Um, they're seeing these issues and they are taking steps to address them. They're not only issuing summonses, but they're also educating the visitors to the area and the businesses alike. Additionally, we have our Safe Neighborhood Bureau officers who have been in communication with store owners, trying to develop solutions, and this remains a priority and we'll continue to monitor and address them. And lastly, um, specifically the item regarding Rosedale and General Johnson. Um, as with any resolution or initiative aimed at increasing safety in a particular area, the police department is certainly prepared to do our part in helping achieve that. We look forward to working with the engineering department, Mercer County DOT, Princeton uh, Pedestrian and Bicycle Advisory Committee to help with identifying and addressing any safety concerns within that area. 
Um, in the meantime, uh, as we await those discussions, our Traffic Safety Bureau is in the process of conducting a study of the area. Um, we're going to have increased patrol presence in that area, and we're going to be deploying our variable message boards in that area as soon as tomorrow. Um, just to touch briefly on um, Mr. Cohen's, um, I guess, uh, point about the, the crossing guard situation out there. Uh, the crossing guard, we never had a crossing guard situation out there because we never felt that the pedestrian traffic activity was high enough to support that. The data always show that there was not a frequent flow of pedestrian traffic through the area. That's why that there is never one staff. Um, it was, according to our records, it was never deemed dangerous or anything like that. We went back and we reviewed our, our crash data uh, for the last 10 years, and we only noted one uh, accident at that intersection over the last 10 years. Um, so we're looking for other areas to increase safety in the area, um, other measures that we can take, and through proactive discussions with all those groups, hopefully we could uh, see those and develop solutions for it to make the area a little bit more safe. That's about all I have for you this evening. Um, any questions? Okay, Leticia, and then we'll go to Michelle. Yes, uh, thank you for that report. Uh, one of the, it's not so much a question, but a comment uh, on one, and I do have some questions. Uh, so my comment is uh, when you mentioned the increase um, in parking enforcement and Witherspoon Jackson, and also some of the increased call, call volume, um, I just wanted to point out that uh, uh, some information that I received from uh, Chief Morgan regarding uh, overnight uh, parking enforcement, uh, that uh, according to his numbers pre-pandemic, that the police received over 4,000 requests uh, from residents wishing uh, uh, to park their car on the street overnight because of the parking restrictions. And also that over 2,000 summonses have been issued for violation of the overnight parking enforcement. So I just want to point that out that that's one of the issues that the uh, permit parking task force is trying to address. Uh, my questions regarding your reports. Um, I was just curious, I noticed in the October, for October 20th in, in 2020, that there was increase in overtime. And I was trying to, I was wondering what was going on at that time that there was an increase in overtime. I, October of 2020? Yes. Um, I don't have the October 2020. I know there was, we had a, an increase in the April and May. Uh, over well, you know what? And I don't know why I put October, but yes, because those were the two reports that were. Yeah. yeah. So the April and May, the, the increase in that overtime had to stem from time off issues that officers are banking time off as a result of last year's pandemic. Now that we've transitioned to normal operations, those officers are starting to utilize more of that accrued time off that was banked in their time banks. As a result, patrol squads have fallen to minimum levels. Um, we've had some illnesses and some other issues over the course of the last two months that when, an, on a, when somebody, one person calls out sick, it generates overtime as a result of that. So that's why those overtime numbers have been spiking over the last two months. It's had to do with illnesses when there was already a minimum staffing level. Okay, thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, and the other one, I believe it was the May report where, uh, you know, I, I, since we started receiving uh, the reports on summonses versus uh, warnings, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I take a look at them. And I know Chief Morgan also mentioned that it's something that is regularly being monitored. I know, I noticed that there was a significant uh, increase in in this uh, citations issued for our uh, Hispanic and Asian population compared to others. And I was just wondering if, uh, when was the last time that the police, uh, that the department conducted bias training and, and, uh, and if not recently, when that might uh, take place? Yeah, I believe our bias training was in, in April. Uh, we get it every single year. We did identify that same thing that you're that you're referencing. Um, our, it's actually identified in our what's called our risk assessment committee. So those patterns and trends are are looked at. Um, we took a look at those numbers. We looked at the last month's numbers. We noticed that there was wasn't the same 
variation in those. Um, there was a less, less summonses to warnings. Uh, we went back and reviewed some of these motor vehicle stops. Uh, we looked at the reasons for the stops. We do our due diligence in trying to see wh why the officers took the appropriate action that they did. Um, the majority of these encounters were as a result of I guess, aggressive driving issues, more of the uh, egregious violations, um, speeding, careless driving, um, certain violations that would, I guess, limit officer discretion when issuing a summons versus a warning. Um, something we're gonna to continue to monitor that a risk assessment can, uh, committee continues to meet and it goes over, I guess, data like this to try to identify negative patterns or trends. And if they do come to become issues, uh, we'll take uh, appropriate steps to make sure they try to address them. But every single one we're trying to review and monitor. We spoke with frontline supervisors about monitoring these on the front lines. Um, and that's where we're at. We'll continue to look forward to that. Great, thank you. Thank you for, uh, for your responses. That's all I have. Yeah, I believe Michelle was next. Yes, uh, thank you for your reports. Um, I really appreciate the hard work uh, everyone's doing. Uh, this is a comment um, just to share and uh, see, I don't know what the solution is, but I know that we really need to change behavior now in terms of the curbside pickup zone that we had for emergency COVID. Um, and I know that it's been, um, it's really trying for everybody, for residents, for the businesses. Um, and I've had some businesses, you know, kind of upset because people are getting ticketed on the, on the one hand, on the other hand, we need to change the behavior of people who've gotten used to that um, curbside pickup. So I just wanted to get your take on kind of where we are and, and, and how we might be moving towards remedying that, you know, if giving warnings is helpful, if we need to continue to do ticketing, um, you know, it, it's a tough, it's, I know it's a tough situation. Well, thank you for your comments. Um, we're trying everything possible. I mean, these are, these are issues that we've never seen before. So we're kind of writing the playbook as we're going in terms of COVID and curbside pickup stuff that we've never really, you know, had in that area. Um, our parking enforcement officers have been absolutely tremendous in trying to help us address these. Um, they have been working with businesses. They've been working with engineering. Um, we find that they are sometimes the biggest experts that we have in trying to regulate parking just because they're out there every single day trying to you know, combat this. Um, what we tried to emphasize to them was uh, a lot of these problems aren't going to be fixed with strictly enforcement. It has to be the education of it. So they are working not only with the visitors to the area, but also with businesses to make them aware of the parking situation. It kind of goes hand in hand. We have to try to understand that the visitors are want some place to park while the businesses want to conduct their business. And you know, by working together, I'm sure we're gonna develop solutions, but we're gonna to continue to, to monitor that area. Um, we do frequent foot patrols with our officers. We do over a hundred foot patrols a month, specifically in the downtown, to get officers out in that area and visible. So between the, uh, all the robust methods that we're trying, we're hoping that we're gonna get out in front of this. Okay, no, I appreciate it. I saw the, the flashing light sign. This is no stopping, we no curbside. <laughs> Those are our variable message boards. Anything that we can do to try to get word and notice out, uh, we're trying. Um, okay. You're using social media, um, some other factors, but you know, we think that it's working. Again, we, we, we've seen some progress, but again, the issues remain. We know they remain and we're working, take steps to try to you know, limit them. Thank you. Okay, let's go even then, David. I think Dwayne had his uh, hand up too at, at some point. Um, I just wanted to uh, thank you for the report. Uh, I really appreciate also, I had requested uh, a couple of months ago, I think, that data prior to 2020 get added in because once you start reaching the point where there's the pandemic, then it, you're, you don't know what you're comparing people's behavior is so. So I really appreciate having the 2019 data in there as a, as a baseline. I express my thanks to the chief, but want to express it to you as well. So I wanted to follow up a little bit on um, Leticia's comment, because I know a number of years ago, and, and it could be that this is an expensive procedure to do, but um, the police department worked with uh, some group at Rutgers that helped with a study and, and what, and, and I'm not gonna remember the exact details, but what I do remember is um, 
they uh, analyzed uh, stops during the nighttime and during the daytime and found, and at nighttime and having ridden along with a police officer, at least in my experience, you cannot tell what race, ethnicity or anything somebody is when you're coming up behind them at night, it's really impossible. And so comparing nighttime uh, stops with daytime stops really gives you some sense of, is there some kind of, uh, you know, implicit bias happening when, when someone is, is pulled over. Um, and in fact, I think what the data showed is that it clearly showed that the police uh, force was overcompensating during the day when they could uh, possibly discern, uh, you know, what at race or ethnicity uh, somebody was that that clearly from the data that consciousness is there. But that was a while ago, maybe 2015, 16. And I'm wondering if there's any plans to uh, have that same group come in and kind of redo that study since we're five to seven years out. Yeah, uh, that's the, I do remember that study. That was a little bit before my time within the police administration. So I don't have that the data available. Um, I guess discussions about that have been limited recently just because of the, the pandemic and COVID, everything kind of shut down during that time. Um, I can certainly relay that to the chief and bring that up during our command staff meetings as a, as a possibility to pursue, but I'll, I'll certainly take a note of it and have the chief contact you in the future and try to uh, see if we're interested in going through that route and getting that same study done. I don't know the particulars of it. Like I said, this was a little bit before my time, but um, I'm certainly uh, would be free to talk to the chief about it and, and see if he can meet, uh, contact you and, and, and get some ideas together. All right, thank you. Wayne and David. Uh, thanks, Mayor, and uh, thanks, Eve, earlier. Um, just a quick question. Um, looking at the, uh, the crime stats for the town, I think I, I may have asked this before, but I, I can't remember. Um, I must have asked it, it could have been a year ago, um, but I, I can't recall what the answer is exactly. Uh, when you look at like the crime stats, um, do we ever include the, of, of course, we're looking at uh, what the, the Princeton Police Department does. Do we ever include data anywhere on those stats uh, of what happens with um, the university police? Because what I'm trying to figure out if someone, because there's, there's just certain things, I was, certain particular offenses I was looking at. And I was just wondering if university uh, stats are ever included. So if someone, they want to get a snapshot of what's happening in the town. If, if that would be there, or is it just what the Princeton Police Department investigates? What do you think to that? Uh, I, everything in, the, in our police report was generated information, statistics, and relevant facts based upon our police data interactions and encounters. Um, the police department for the university, their public safety um, is a uh, policing agency. So I'm right. sure they do keep their own information and stats. There is a certain degree of information sharing that takes place between the two entities. Um, but to my knowledge that we don't include their specific numbers um, into our report or the framing in our report, but that's something that um, uh, council would like to see. I can certainly talk to the chief about it. Um, again, it would have to be the university, you know, I guess willingly sharing more and more information with us, which again, that would be, I guess, um, open to some conversations first, but um, to my knowledge, again, this is all reported data strictly to our agency. Okay, thanks. Hey. Yeah, uh, two things. First, I just want to point out, I noticed that in the uh, attendees, uh, Lisa Sariusall, who's the chair of the Pedestrian and Bicycle Advisory Committee, has her hand up. I assume she has a question uh, relevant to the um, resolution that PBAC passed and, and the lieutenant's um, comments about that. So after I go, um, it'd be great if she could be allowed to ask her question. Um, the question I had was just, I know that there's been a lot of reporting in the national press about increased crime uh, coming out of COVID. And I'm curious whether in Princeton we've seen any uh, any hint of that, or are we in a situation that's pretty constant, uh, you know, from before pandemic, during pandemic, and after? I, where we're at right now, we're still not seeing those numbers of uh, pre-pandemic, and that's kind of across the board, whether it's crime-related, whether it's uh, enforcement-related. Um, everything that we're doing is, is still trending up, but still nowhere near where we were in 
2019 for today. Again, just like uh, uh, Ms. Niedergan said, it's, that's why we started including these numbers from 2019 so we can get a better idea of, of, of where we are at in terms of coming out of this pandemic. Um, there hasn't been really any glaring things that have popped out to us that is uh, showing us a, a, an advanced increase as a result of the pandemic. I guess the only thing that remains high is, is our, uh, our firearms applications permits. Um, they remain you know, consistently high uh, post, you know, uh, uh, at where they were pre-pandemic. Uh, right. But as far as like uh, property offenses and other crimes, um, nothing, no significant jumps or leaps. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, before we jump over to Lisa and are there any other specific council questions on the two uh, police reports? Okay. Adam, could you let Lisa into the meeting? Uh, yes, no problem, Mayor. Thank you. Good evening, Council. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Lieutenant Sullivan. Um, thank you for including me in this. I wanted to say thank you, first of all, that um, you're your uh, cars and your officers have been noted by the parents of uh, families at Johnson Park that walk with their kids um, to and from. Um, but they have also commented that by obvious presence that um, will probably skew the observations that you're going to get out of what's happening um, at that intersection because obviously, um, when people see a policeman or an, a car, they're, they're adjusting their behavior. So I uh, don't know how to get you around that situation unless you wanna be either unmarked or um, whatever. Um, but I can tell um, that reports that we've had at the committee are that the PTO has had on three successive months complaints from parents uh, where the um, complaints were heard by members of the school board and the school board then went to the school administrators, uh, sorry, administrators um, to discuss the issue and try to find solutions for this, this crossing um, situation that everyone feels is an accident or a crash, excuse me, a crash waiting to happen. So um, I would be happy to put you in contact with the the PTO officers or the, um, the principal, if that helps um, to broaden the information that you're getting. Um, and we can talk about that separately. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, like I said, we're, we're looking forward to the conversations. Um, our, our knowledge of the area is based upon, again, uh, doing research and studying, and that's nowhere near as, as, those, as good as those who actually, you know, walk to school and walk their kids to school every day and the administrators who, who travel to the school every day. Um, the limited information that I received for the meeting was we did have our traffic safety officer go out there in a low profile unit um, this afternoon to conduct a very brief study um, of who is coming and going through that crossing. That's what we based the limited information that I have on. Um, again, there was one student that was crossing in the morning and then in the afternoon hours, it was uh, three students. Um, all, during all occasions, the officer noted in his report that the four students that were crossing in both times total had no issues crossing the roadway and um, seemingly took a detailed re report um, that you know, was forwarded to us. And again, um, I know we, ha we have a conversation uh, uh, scheduled for tomorrow and we can certainly talk more about you know, uh, taking more measures and speaking with school staff members. Again, this is just the beginning of our uh, research and uh, fact collecting, and hopefully through a bunch of those meetings, we'll be able to uh, get some better hand on the situation. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. David? I just wanted to offer one follow-up observation from the discussion that, that we had at the committee, which is that there really is a special set of circumstances that's COVID-related whereby parents, a lot of parents who perhaps used to uh, let their kids ride a bus are actually driving their kids to school because they don't want them to be on the bus because of COVID. That's causing backups, automobile backups in the driveway, apparently all the way down from the school to the actual turning in from Rosedale. 
And the fact that those backups are happening um, is causing some of the hazardous driver behavior where people get, are getting stuck behind a queue of cars who want to just go through and uh, are misbehaving, you know, sort of cutting, cutting around the, the, the cars waiting to turn. So I just wanted to make sure you were aware of that aspect of it. Yeah, we'll, uh, we have our extra patrol presence in the area. We'll certainly uh, continue to monitor that. And again, um, we hope to have talks with uh, the engineering department. I know Ms. Stockton is well aware of uh, these situations and the concerns. Um, our traffic safety officer, Sergeant Murray, um, again, he was the officer who went out and did our study today. And, and uh, we'll continue to monitor the area, both vehicle traffic, pedestrian traffic, and we hope to learn more about it and um, hopefully offer a uh, informed recommendation by talking to a bunch of different entities. Thank you. Thank you. So, okay. So were there any other announcements or reports? Council, staff, Dwayne. I'm sorry, Mayor. Um, one, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, earlier this month, uh, Corner House uh, hosted an award ceremony where in addition to highlighting the great work that Corner House has been doing and uh, the Corner House staff uh, on behalf of, um, uh, behavioral health issues and, uh, and addiction issues and uh, youth services. Uh, Courthouse did uh, um, present two, I will say, uh, well-deserved awards. Uh, the first was the uh, Mayor Jim Floyd uh, Community, uh, Community Partner Award, which was given to the uh, Princeton Police Department. And our recently retired um, um, chief uh, came back to accept on behalf of the uh, on behalf of the uh, uh, police department. And it also added, in addition to the police department, there's also uh, PBA 130 was, uh, was honored uh, simultaneously. Um, the other award was given to, another award was given to um, our uh, board member who just been doing tremendous work on behalf of Corner House, and, uh, who is uh, Leah McDonald. So I just wanted, I'll be remiss if I didn't mention that. And my apologies for not uh, mentioning uh, that earlier, Mayor. Thank you, Dwayne. Mia? Yeah, I had one more announcement. Um, tomorrow night is the last board me meeting for Superintendent Barry Galasso. So if anyone wants to attend and um, bid him fa farewell and thank him, um, he stepped in as interim superintendent um, <laughs> and faced a really unexpected um, interim period. And he uh, did a really fabulous job um, negotiating um, all of the complexities of COVID and, and helping um, our school children get through that in our district. And so a big thank you to him from the town. Um, and uh, I hope people will show up tomorrow night to um, show appreciation for what he's done. So. Thank you, Mia. Okay, moving on. Uh, the next part of the meeting is public comments for items not on the agenda. If you want to comment on something that's on the agenda, just wait till that item comes up. But this would be if you had something that you want to talk about that's not on the agenda. Okay. Um, Adam Kipcherry has her hand up. Can you bring her in? Uh, yes, Mayor. Kip, if you could unmute. Okay, I'm unmuted. Yep. All right. So um, I'd like to um, real quickly bring up the transit waste study. Uh, of New Jersey Transit. So I have a, a little amount of uh, material I want to just clue you in on. Uh, good evening. I'm Kip Cherry, a stakeholder for New Jersey Transit's Dinky, Dinky's Transit Waste Study. I have several concerns regarding the study and I want to share uh, those with you and the hopes that um, you as mayor and council will communicate your own concerns. First, I'm very concerned about efforts to um, project future ridership for the Dinky. Historic ridership data does not account for events and conditions that have had a distinctly negative impact on ridership. I raised the concern with New Jersey Transit several weeks ago, but I felt that I did not get really uh, any uh, positive reaction. I believe uh, that you, Mayor uh, Frieda, also raised a concern about this at the April stakeholder meeting. As you know, there was a major decrease in ridership uh, when the station was relocated in 2012 in 2018, ridership was just about back to the pre-location, the pre-relocation level when service was curtailed uh, because of a system-wide shortage of train engineers. 
Finally, as New Jersey Transit began to succeed in moving prospective engineers through the training program, the pandemic hit. So clearly the historic numbers do not provide a sound basis for predicting future ridership. I am also concerned about the online survey New Jersey Transit has recently completed. We are told that New Jersey Transit has a statistical process for quantifying survey responses and calculating results. However, there are major questions on uh, regarding the sampling techniques that were used and questions regarding the poorly wording and confusing uh, topics on the uh, survey. Decisions should not be made about the future of the Princeton branch on the basis of such a clearly unscientific survey and misleading ridership data. Instead, the focus should be on key regional growth factors and TOD opportunities. This is my opinion. Secondly, I am concerned with the framing of the no build alternative in the study. According to New Jersey Transit, this option would, uh, will be used to evaluate what would be needed to retain rail service as it exists today. It is critical that the no build alternative look at all of the options. New Jersey Transit has explained that the new rolling stock it plans to use on the Northeast Corridor will not work on, uh, for the dinky and that the current aero cars are reaching the end of their useful lives. This technically is true. However, in framing the issue, there are options that have not been put on the table. There's no reason why New Jersey Transit couldn't keep two or three well-maintained aero cars for service and keep up to uh, a dozen aero cars in uh, a weather protected storage facility for parts. Under this scenario, the life of the aero cars could be extended for quite some time. Uh, also, SEPTA's silver liners are also uh, able to operate on the Princeton branch. In closing, the transit waste study should also consider as an option, the most recent version of the Railroad Development Corporation's proposal for operating a new dinky on, uh, as a short line. My understanding is that RDC has submitted a proposal through the transit waste study process and that the proposal has been structured to deal with federal safety regulations and New Jersey Transit's procurement policies. My understanding further is that a demonstration of this proposal is actually being set up at a location not far from Princeton. And I might add that um, this is at extreme expense. These cars have been uh, brought in by ship from the UK and they're being set up to demonstrate how a new uh, dinky could operate on rail line. Um, thank you very much. I encourage you as uh, mayor and, and council to express your own concerns regarding the transit waste study. And I'm glad to answer any questions. Kip, thank you very much. Just as a general reminder to everyone, um, public comments limited to three minutes per person. Kip went a little bit over, but not much. So uh, thank you, Kip, for, uh, for staying pretty close to the guideline. Um, are, there, uh, are there other members of the public that have uh, comments for items not on the agenda? We do have a couple emails, which we'll, we'll read if there's no one else that has anything to say prior to that. Not seeing any hands, Mayor. All right, thank you very much, Adam. Okay, so we had uh, two short emails. Uh, one is from Robert Lerner. Uh, he wrote, the purpose of a business district in a small town like Princeton is to do business. I sincerely hope you will act in the best interest of our local business community when considering post-COVID options, especially the traffic flow on Witherspoon Street. As for bicyclists in our community, I suggest they can ride their bikes in one of our many beautiful parks. Okay, that was one comment. And... Um, let me, let me read the, the, the other one is titled um, in reference to ordinance 2021-14, which is on the agenda tonight, but the information in the, in the email, let me read it and you'll see why I'm gonna put it as an item not on, the, not on the agenda, sorry for that. This is from Charles Skinner. Um, Princeton Shopping Center is a central community resource that pre should be preserved as is. All retail areas have suffered during the COVID pandemic, including downtown Nassau Street. This general retail downturn is not a reason to hand massive tax breaks pilots to would-be developers of the Princeton Shopping Center who could well turn it into another failed Forestall Village or Route 1 strip mall. The Sustainable Princeton Fair of April 24th was a vivid example of how valuable the Princeton Shopping Center courtyard is as a community resource. 
Another example is the Blue Bears restaurant that is dedicated to providing a place of dignity to work for ind individuals with intellectual and development disabilities. Nomad saw a business opportunity in Princeton Shopping Center and opened a new pizza restaurant without any pilots. The New York Sports Club at Princeton Shopping Center was thriving, but closed on the day of Governor Murphy's COVID order, contrary to the claim of multiple vacancies well before COVID in the preliminary investigation report by Carlos Rodriguez. I know because I was a regular New York Sports Club member who suddenly could not enter the club that day. McCaffrey's, Ace Hardware, Walgreens, and many other shopping center stores well served the community. The loss in property taxes from pilots would necessarily, would necessarily increase in taxes on Princeton residents. Far from being obsolete, the Princeton Shopping Center is an essential community resource that should be preserved as is. So I added that under items not on the agenda because the two ordinances talk about um, projects that are tied to our affordable housing uh, court mandate from uh, December of last year. So I just wanted to share Charles's comments because they don't exactly pertain to the, uh, the ordinance that we'll be discussing later. Okay, let me, let me just, David, let me just see if there's any other public comment real quick and then I'll jump right to you, sorry. A anyone else from the public with a comment? For items not on the agenda? Still right. no hands, Mayor. Still no hands, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, we'll close that part of the meeting. David, did you wanna, sorry. Maybe. Well, I just wanted to ask, I got an email from Grace Sindon who um, had, you know, she sent an email, she realized it was late after the deadline. She was trying to attend the meeting tonight, but couldn't navigate the Zoom. So she was hoping somebody could read her letter. I, you know, I don't want to overly- right. but I think Michelle's gonna do it, but Grace's does actually, I, I, I haven't had a chance to see Grace's, sorry, it's too many things going on at once for me to read an email while trying to run the meeting. But I, yeah. I was under the impression her email might actually pertain to one of the ordinances. Okay, that's yeah. fine. So we'll do it. We'll we'll do it then. Okay. Thank you though for bringing that up. Always better to make sure we let everybody be heard. Okay. So we close the public comment uh, for items not on the agenda. Now we'll go to the uh, the public hearing on the two ordinances, and the first ordinance is Ordinance 2021-14, Ordinance of the Municipality of Princeton adopting a redevelopment plan for property located at North Harrison Street, also known as Block 7401, a portion of Lot 1.011, uh, pursuant to the Local Development and Housing Law, NJSA 4812A-1. Um, okay, does someone wanna move that and then we can have discussion. David, thank you. Mia's got the second. Okay. Um, can I, I think we've got a, a problem in that the planner and the attorney who are supposed to be part of this discussion are, have not been brought into the meeting yet. Okay, we'll bring them in. Um, Adam, can you bring in Michael Sullivan, and Michael Sullivan and our staff planner, Michael Laplace and um, Is Frank doing this? And Frank uh, Reagan, Reagan, the attorney. I'm sorry, what was the second name? Um, oh, our staff planner, Michael Laplace. Michael Laplace. Oh, I see him now, sorry. Okay, who's, uh, who's first? Okay. Thank you, Adam. No problem. And I don't know which of the Michaels. Which, are one of the Michaels going first or? Michael and Michael, one of you speak up. Mayor and council, we were gonna um, have, I believe our redevelopment attorneys kick off. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, we, 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 we had a 33% chance and we got it wrong. Okay, <laughs> right? There's always plenty of Michaels in. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, Obviously, the council introduced uh, this ordinance at last month's meeting. It was referred to the planning board uh, for consistency review. I think it was last Thursday, um, or maybe it was, I'm sorry, uh, June 3rd, that the planning board reviewed uh, the redevelopment plan and determined that it was consistent with the master plan. And I believe uh, Mr. Laplace submitted a memo to that effect. And I believe that Michael Sullivan, who made a presentation 
with regards to the plan at the planning board meeting uh, is prepared to do the same this evening with uh, Mr. Laplace jumping in as may be necessary. Okay, uh, can you hear me folks? Yes, we can. Okay. Is there some um, reason, Michael, sorry, is there some reason why we can't see the participants, Frank, Michael and Michael, is, is are you not able to turn on your video? Uh, video's on, I, I, it's, I don't know what it is. Oh, we're not. I, I do. They've been brought in. They've been allowed to speak rather than being brought in as participants. Yeah, yes, I can they, can be them changed, to, uh, they can be changed to participants so they can show their video. Yep. So Adam would have to change them over to. Yep. Adam's about to do that. All right, here we go. I'm happy. <laughs> Which I, I thought everyone was having a bad hair day or something. So. <laughs> Well, Michael, well, Adam's working on that, whichever that. Michael's going first, you can start. It should be about set up. Okay. Just trying to, oh, okay, there we go. I think we're in business. You are. We are. Right. Thanks, Frank. Um, and good to see everybody again. The last time I was here was for about uh, 15 seconds on uh, May 24th when you uh, introduce these uh, two redevelopment plans. Um, for the record, I'm Michael Sullivan with Clark Kate and Hints. We're the affordable housing planning consultants that have been working with Princeton since last year to uh, shepherd uh, the process of compliance with uh, uh, the court uh, mandate to comply with the affordable housing uh, decision of 2015. Uh, we prepared the 2020 uh, housing plan element fair share plan and we continue to work with the municipality on the implementation. And tonight, uh, I'm gonna talk about two uh, of these elements, two redevelopment plans on uh, have been referred, as Frank said, to the planning board and introduced. Uh, the dates on these draft uh, plans, uh, both of them is May 21st, 2021. Uh, the first one is the Harrison Terry Hune redevelopment plan. Uh, and the second is the Princeton Shopping Center inclusionary residential redevelopment. Right, so Michael, we're um, talking both about that. Michael, just for the for this, we're doing we're doing two separate ordinance hearings, so we just got to make sure we're just doing one at a time. I'll, I can do it however you'd like to. So right, no, just, um, I yeah, can we're, we're going to handle it as two separate or it's two separate ordinances on the agenda. So we just to make sure we do. One That's fine. Um, they they, they do have some commonalities with respect to the compliance with affordable housing. So I'll get those generalities out of the way, and then we'll talk about each specifically. Um, so let's first talk about the uh, Harrison Terhune redevelopment plan. And this again uh, is, is within the overall North Harrison redevelopment area, which was designated on April 27th of this year. Um, and the North Harrison or the Harrison Terhune redevelopment plan uh, put up a, a quick exhibit. And if I can share my, share my screen. So. I'm now sharing a, a, an overall aerial of that. Is that visible? Yes, it is. Okay. So this is an aerial that shows uh, it's oriented north to south, generally uh, with the shopping center in the middle. Um, and that's really the heart of the North Harrison redevelopment area. Uh, the area of the Her Harrison Terhune redevelopment plan is located at the north end at the corner of Harrison, North Harrison and Terhune Road. It's outlined in yellow here just above the parking lot for the existing Princeton Shopping Center. Um, and the, the redevelopment plan for uh, the, uh, Harrison Terhune really takes uh, most of the, uh, the, the bulk of the, of the standards which are within the AH5 zone, which is currently in place uh, on the site uh, and which was enacted as part of the implementation of the housing plan element, uh, which is known as the comfort or wind site. Uh, and the redevelopment plan takes the standards and requirements that are uh, within the AH5 and it wraps it within this redevelopment plan uh, such that uh, it maintains the requirements that the um, court ordered, uh, court approved uh, housing plan had for this site. Um, it consists of uh, zoning that permits multifamily apartments and has a limit of 130 uh, dwelling units or apartments on the site. Uh, it also mandates that there could be no less than 12 affordable housing dwelling units developed here, which is consistent with the uh, court approved plan 
Um, but that in the event, you know, if they are able to build 130 units, then they would actually require 26 uh, units because the minimum is also 20%. Um, so as they build more, they have to provide more, but they can't uh, go below the, uh, the floor of the number of affordable housing dwelling units. The plan also includes, uh, it develops larger uh, and more robust standards with respect to the site development and the architectural development of this, uh, this site, which is something you can do within the framework of a redevelopment plan. And uh, it, the bulk of the architectural standards really serve to um, uh, better articulate the building form in order to modulate the scale of the building uh, as it sits within the context of the intersection and the, and the street frontage of, of Harrison and Terhune. There are also standards dealing with how access, both vehicular access and non-vehicular access is handled here to engage uh, with uh, multi-use paths and some open space as well. Um, and there is a public art requirement um, among other uh, embellishments and enhancements to the zoning, which were enabled because of a um, you know, process that uh, the municipality went through with the, uh, the owner and developer of the project to actually better inform the zoning that's within the redevelopment plan and the design standards in there. So um, this plan uh, will continue to be consistent with and fulfill the affordable housing plan while also allowing for um, uh, redevelopment of this site with enhanced architectural standards, access and open space. Um, and will ultimately become part of a comprehensive redevelopment of this, of the North Harrison redevelopment area that will include um, the uh, shopping center as well. Thank you, thank you, Michael. Uh, the other Michael, do you, are you adding anything before we move on to council comments? Um, um, Mr. Mayor, I think that Michael Great job covering the major points. I would just like to add that the planning board felt um, very strongly that this proposal is in conformance with the master plan and that it meets lots of the goals within the master plan, such as um, improving the stock and diversity of housing in Princeton um, and all other um, objectives, such as encouraging new green building uh, construction and sustainable development within the town. So the planning board felt very positive about the proposed ordinance. Thank you, Michael. Okay, um, let's get to council questions and then we'll get to public uh, questions and comments. Any, uh, any council questions or comments at this time? All right. Seeing none. I'm sorry, Leticia? Yeah, just something quick. And I don't know if it's covered, uh, you know, in reading the ordinance, uh, how much detail has been uh, decided already. But uh, as far as for the, I was happy to see that, uh, that uh, in this development, uh, that the affordable housing, um, that the units that are designated as affordable housing that it would provide for at least uh, the one parking spot as opposed to other developments where, where the tenants are have to pay in addition to what they already pay in rent, which is a burden for some uh, of the tenants in that reside in the affordable housing units. But my question had to do more with, um, uh, I, I read the, the description where it says, uh, that the unit affordable housing units uh, must be comparable quality and no different in the exterior. Uh, I was just wondering if if the if it was addressed where the units, the size of the units, if they're comparable to the regular units, the affordable housing units, but also where they're located. Because generally I know that in other developments, the affordable housing units tend to be in less desirable places, such as in the back facing the parking lot, the parking garage. And, and also they, they're not actually comparable uh, compared to the uh, market rate units. So I was wondering if, if that had been addressed. 
I think that's something that's probably comes at site at the at the next stage when it comes back before the planning board, but I'm not sure. Michael, do you know? Yeah, that, that's the type of thing where there's not enough detail in the development of the uh, prototypes and that were explored here. Um, but that's something that uh, would be dealt with at the um, at the planning board approval process. And in general, um, uh, what these when these projects come in, they these units are are dispersed within uh, e you know the term is usually equally dispersed within the buildings or or building. And so that would indicate to me, if I were uh, tagging conformance with that, that it would be that, you know, depend, it, they wouldn't be relegated to one floor. They wouldn't be concentrated on one side or the other. And that can be assured through the redevelopment or the redevelopment plan or the redevelopment project at the site plan hearing. Okay. okay. And, and that's what I wanted to clarify, whether that would still be an opportunity to address that. Later. Yes. Additionally, okay. Councilwoman, additionally, uh, as Michael said, I mean, the site plan should reflect where the affordable units, you know, will be located, but we also have the opportunity in, in negotiating a uh, ultimately negotiating a redevelopment agreement uh, with the developer of that project to ensure, you know, that that happens. So I think there'll be two opportunities uh, to, to, to do that. Okay, thank you. That's a good point to see. David, bringing it up. Yeah, and I just wanted to tag on to what uh, Mr. Reagan was saying that the redevelopment agreement comes back to council. So the, the site plan goes to the planning board and we don't really have an opportunity to have a lot of input on that as a council, but we will have an opportunity to have input on the redevelopment agreement. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, are there members of the public that have questions or comments? Your hands, Mayor. Okay. Michelle, oh, here's one. Oh, okay. We have uh, Kip Cherry. All right, while we bring her in. Sorry, I, since I was here, I couldn't help myself. Um, <laughs> you know that, <laughs> you know, I've had a long-term concern about fire safety. And uh, unfortunately at the state level, um, Weinberg's bill still has not passed yet. And uh, we'll be dragging along into next year. And uh, so we have not been able to reform the building code at the state level. But, uh, you know, I know that the building code is not um, negotiated locally. That's a state issue. But I will point out that uh, we were working before on an ordinance related to the construction period, which is a state, which is a local purview. And uh, a number of the fires that have occurred have occurred during the uh, construction stage. So I just wanted to bring that up, that that's still a possibility. And, uh, you know, every so often I come up for air and realize that, you know, that we, the ordinance kind of got stalled out. But um, I still think it's a very important thing. And that's one thing that the town does have jurisdiction to, to do is, is David. Uh, you know, David has a lot of expertise in that. Right. Mia, did you want to comment? I just wanted to say, Kip, that um, with uh, Avalon uh, on the Thanet site, we had... Um, negotiated in, in the agreement for a fire watch during construction. And I anticipate that we'll be um, negotiating uh, with this a similar arrangement with the developers on the shopping center site. And Mayor David, I, I also thought, didn't Avalon represent that the fire safety measures they took in their development on Witherspoon Street, they would also do here because some of the things they did for us on Witherspoon were over and above the state fire code. Yes, it will involve um, masonry in the, um, as opposed to um, drywall in, in the, uh, in the, yeah, the fire, firewall, the firewall, the firewall yeah. between units, yep. And also a commercial grade sprinkler system rather than residential sprinklers. And, um, okay, thank you. Thank you, Kip. Do we, do we have you. any other members of the, uh, of the public that wish to make a comment or ask a question? Okay, uh, Michelle, do you have Grace's? I, I do, I have Grace's letter. So following on the same theme. So this is from Grace Sindin um, from Ridgeview Circle. And she writes, um, let me get to the top. I'm sending my uh, comments regarding two ordinances, 2021-14 uh, and 15 as in the Mayor and Council agenda tonight. 
I want to bring to attention uh, public safety issues regarding fire hazards in the proposed new housing developments in the area of the Princeton Shopping Center. This problem is, sorry, switch to my dog. Wants to, okay. This problem is exacerbated by the density of the proposed structures in that area. My concerns expressed here are aside from the more broad issues of greatly increased motor vehicle traffic, greater road hazards, as well as degradation of air and water quality from these factors. I understand the history of the ordinance proposals and recognize the need for affordable housing. However, this should be accomplished with greater fire safety as noted in proposed state legislation of Senate Bill S-2051. These developments should also be made in as an environmentally sustainable way as possible. For the shopping center itself, when it is redeveloped, that means A, retaining the green courtyard, B, retaining the protective covered walkways, and C, keeping abundant parking three features, which make that a unique venue. I hope that Mayor and Council will send a resolution to the legislature supporting S2051 as the then Princeton governing body did with its predecessor legislation. I can help facilitate that. Three of the five proposed developments in the area of the Princeton Shopping Center, including Thanet Road, are proposed to be built by the Avalon Bay Company. This is pertaining now to Avalon Bay. Avalon Bay's history of housing fires is very disturbing, e.g. one, this past spring, a large fire at their Princeton Junction apartments caused 22 people in seven families to lose their homes. This is the company's fourth known fire in New Jersey to their most serious fire with large media coverage in January 2015 in Edgewater, New Jersey, caused 500 people to lose their homes. Another 500 people were temporarily evacuated on this very cold night. In addition, Avalon Bay's large under construction housing in the year 2000 at the same Edgewater site destroyed nine close by occupied homes. Four, their Maplewood housing under construction in 2017 also went up in flames. The use of large light frames, some call stick, highly combustible wood, multi-unit construction allows fires to spread quickly. Even if there are no deaths, the one, loss of one's home is tragic and traumatic in residents and costly to municipalities. During the pandemic, the loss of such housing also means the loss of one's place of employment or for children, the loss of their schoolroom. Currently proposed New Jersey Senate Bill S-2051 limits the size and scale of light frame wood construction in large multi-unit housing, thus encouraging use of more fire safe masonry concrete. Over the years, fire codes have been degraded at the national and state level. This is largely due to developer influence in the code writing process. The voices of firefighters are less heated, though their safety and lives are on the line. Municipalities bear myriad costs of such fires and services required as well as lost revenue. Until more, to, more protective fire codes for large wood multi-unit developments are in place, Princeton officials should work with developers for better fire protection using NJ Bill S2051 as a guide. I hope I want to hope you retain the ability of residents to attend public meetings on Zoom. It makes a big difference to me as a senior citizen. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Okay. Any other public comment on this, Mayor? Oh, just we... one point. I just the 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 uh, the comment that uh, Councilwoman just read actually has to do, I guess, applies to the next ordinance. Just so for the record, it's clear that it's with respect to the project. I guess I, I assume with Avalon Bay in particular. Right. Thank you, Frank. Okay. Seeing no other public comment, we'll close the uh, the public hearing on Ordinance Twenty Twenty One Dash Fourteen. And this would be a roll call vote. Ms. Perone Lambros? Yes. Ms. Niedergang? Yes. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Frago? Yes. Mr. Williamson? Yes. Ms. Sachs? Yes. Okay, thank you. Now we have the public hearing on Ordinance 2021-15. Ordinance of the Municipality of Princeton adopting a redevelopment plan for property located at North Harrison Street and Terhune Road, also known as Block 7401, Lots 1.02 and 1.012, pursuant to the Local Redevelopment and Housing Law, NJSA 48-12A-1. Is there a motion on this? David, thank you. Mia has got the second. Okay, sorry. 
Uh, any council questions or comments before we go to public comment? All right, seeing none. Any public comment? Anyone in the audience wishes to make a comment on this ordinance? Not seeing any Not hands, Mayor. Thank you, Adam. Michael, Michael, Frank, anything additional to, uh, to offer? Look, I can just give you the, uh, the Cook's tour of this, uh, this uh, redevelopment plan. I'll pull, my, I'll pull my screen up so um, you can see this. Uh, this aerial um, shows the uh, Princeton Shopping Center inclusionary residential um, redevelopment area or redevelopment zone, which is part of the North Harrison redevelopment area. Again, you can see the shopping center in the center of the property. And then to the bottom, you can see outlined in yellow, the, uh, the PSC inclusionary residential redevelopment zone, which is the subject of the plan. Uh, and that area represents in general, the footprint of the Avalon Bay uh, multifamily um, project that was uh, part of a, a zoning settlement, which created the AH05 zone. And that this, this redevelopment plan will simply wrap that ordinance within the framework of redevelopment uh, plan, just as uh, we did with the AH5. And in this, in this particular case, this permits multifamily apartments again, but it allows up to 200 dwelling units, portable dwelling units, uh, uh, 200 units total. Um, and within that 40 uh, dwelling units must be affordable and there must be 44 affordable housing credits created through the development of this. Um, the redevelopment plan in this case does create, uh, does contain some additional uh, architectural standards to help uh, uh, modulate the scale of this and create uh, more uh, better uh, fenestration uh, of the facades. It also um, creates the ability or the requirement to screen the structured parking because structured parking is, is part of this, but it's screened uh, from adjacent views from homes and from the public uh, street, uh, Har North Harrison Street with the building itself. Um, it has shared access provisions and it has uh, uh, zoning provisions relating to building height and setbacks. And with, this is a little different case where this property is, uh, property lines are going to be created within an existing development. Uh, and they're really gonna be created for the purposes of ownership when vehicular access ways and parking lots are gonna be crossing over these property lines. So it's been done to accommodate that. Um, and uh, ultimately this will fulfill the affordable housing requirements from the court uh, approved settlement um, from 2020. Um, and that's the, there's no change in the intensity uh, or, the, or the number of units that were anticipated. Thank you, Michael. Okay, any other questions or comments from the public? Mr. Mayor, I, I just would like to add that um, this is also, this was also well received and supported by the planning board. Um, the board was particularly excited that this is a not only a component of Princeton's fair share housing plan, an important component, but it also gives us a, the opportunity as a community to look at this important destination, the Princeton Shopping Center, with new eyes. And um, after 70 years since it was first constructed, almost 70 years, a way to really um, rethink the shopping center, keep what we like about it, but also breathe, breathe new life into it. And to also do this in a comprehensive manner, to look at the entire setting of the shopping center. So for those reasons and others, the planning board was very strongly in favor of this ordinance. Thank you, Michael. Okay, uh, last shot. Making sure the public had no other questions. Anyone else on council have any other questions? All right, we'll close the uh, the public hearing part of uh, the public comment part of this, and this is another roll call vote. Ms. Perone Lambros. Yes. Ms. Niedergang. Yes. Mr. Cohen. Yes. Ms. Fraga. Yes. Mr. Williamson? Yes. Ms. Sachs? Yes. Okay. Thank you all. Frank, Michael, Michael, thank you very much. Have a good evening. I just gave all you again. Thank you. Uh, we will be um, finalizing these and put it, taking the draft off, and we'll be putting the adopted date on it, and we'll provide uh, signed and sealed hard copies for the office to have, and we'll provide digital copies for the web and for uh, uh, copies to be made. 
thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Bye. Bye-bye. All right, let's move to the uh, resolutions. Mayor, I'm can sorry, I, you? I, I just want to make a, a quick comment. Uh, thanks to uh, my colleagues, uh, David, uh, me, and Michelle, who have worked really, really hard on this and many other uh, redevelopment uh, ordinances. And uh, the state that we're in today, where everybody uh, who's here seems to understand what's going on and that um, there seems to be community support is, is really, you know, in t a testament to their devotion and the countless hours they've spent on this. So I just well, I can't let this go without acknowledging that. So thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, I'll add a big ditto to what Eve just said. Thanks, George. Well said, Eve. Well deserved. Okay. Moving on to resolutions, 21-198, resolution authorizing an amendment to lease with friends of Herringtown Woods. Um, David. I'll move it. Thank you, David. And this resolution, uh, I think we should uh, right, just change the, uh, the starting date of the, uh, of the agreement, moved it by a few months. That's correct. Steve, that's second or? Thank you very much. Been moved and seconded. Any questions on the resolution? All right, seeing none, all in favor, please say aye or wave a hand. Aye. 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 Okay, that's everyone, so that's unanimous. Uh, resolution 21199, resolution authorizing the payment of $123,722.44 to the Princeton Public Schools for 2020-2021 school year hazardous busing transportation cost. Is there a motion on that? Thank you, Michelle. Is there a second? Thank you, Eve. Any questions on this? Seeing um, no. So one question. Um, um, since we made like improvements, uh, I know we added like the sidewalk on Mount Lucas Road, et cetera. Has, has that cost gone down because of, uh, uh, you know, like engineering and roadway improvements from previous years? I personally have no idea on how to answer that question. Because I don't know the specifics, um, so I could, whole, make some, I could make something up, but I won't. I don't know that we have <laughs> anyone here that could answer that question. I think uh, Deanna's gone, right? She might be able to yeah, answer to guess. Okay, because the whole point of making improvements is 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 so we we um, increase safety. So we're increasing safety. I just want to see if uh, that's having an effect on how much we have to give to the school the school board. Right, David has David, hand up. Yep, David. Yeah, I, I mean, I would think that the Mount Lucas work really wouldn't make a difference because we already had a side path there, but I would hope that the new lights, the traffic signals on you on North Houston, at Franklin and at Hamilton could make a difference. They really are improved um, uh, walk you know, walk friendly signals there. And those are those are really part of a safe routes to school improvement project that was, you know, funded by the federal government. So it may be too early to say. And I also don't fully understand the standards by which the um, hazardous bus routes are determined. But those are the kinds of improvements that one would hope would um, uh, Re reduce the number of hazardous routes that we have. So, Dwayne, we'll, we'll, we'll follow up and try to get an actual answer and explanation. So it'll be good for all of us to, to know that. Well, thanks, Mayor. Thanks, no, David. Thank thanks, Mayor. Any other questions on this one? All right, if not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Right. That, that's everybody. That's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, 20. 21-200, resolution authorizing the award of a contract to JW Pool Inc. for the replacement of seven HVAC rooftop units at Monument Hall, uh, 2021, in the amount of $59,827. And we do have, I know, I think there was a question um, as to, do we need to do this? And, uh, Dan Van Matter had sent an email um, right just about as the meeting started. But anyway, uh, there are 14 rooftop units on Monument Hall.
Half of them were replaced five years ago. The remaining units were installed in 1998. We have spent thousands of dollars keeping the units operational. Uh, this is the reason we are requesting to replace the remaining units. They, uh, the units are aging and most likely will not last much longer. Anyway, I just wanted to share that. David? Yeah, I just wanted to share the question that that was written in response to, uh, because you know ordinarily I would not question a staff uh, advice about you know needing to replace units, but as members of council know, we've been discussing and actually preparing a request for proposal for consultant to study our facilities and help us to consolidate staff in the neighborhood of of Witherspoon Hall and allow us to vacate Monument Hall in the not too distant future. And so it did seem like a large investment um, to just keep the, the building running for the next five to seven years. Um, so uh, I don't know if there is a, I, I don't know, Bernie, if you were able to follow up with Dan and have a conversation to satisfy yourself that other options were looked at, uh, that might um, keep the system running for that five to seven year period without quite as much cost. That I don't know. I do know that this was bid and I believe after you bid something, you have 45 days to award after the bid is due. Perhaps Trista could uh, correct me there. So uh, we may have to award this. It was uh, before my time, but I'll, I'll follow up with Dan. All I know is what the mayor uh, just read, but uh, I'll try to get more information here and see if there are other options. I, I have no additional information that I can add to that. Sorry. All good. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. David, are you a, a, a nay or an abstain? I, I think I'm an A for, for now. Okay, I wasn't sure. Thank you. Okay, so that was that was unanimous, and we'll. Mayor, I'm, I, yes. I need to know who first, who made the motion, and who second. I didn't get that. Okay, uh, very possible. I didn't ask for that, so I thought I did, but we'll do it again. I don't know. Who who wants to make that motion? <laughs> no one wants to make the motion. I'm, I'm a little on the fence because, I mean, I, I did not uh, ask Dan directly, but when this came up, I did, you know, really think about the fact that we are hoping that maybe Monument Hall will not be, you know, under our control for, for that much longer. Um, uh, I, 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 I understand, you know, uh, the staff oh. says it has to get done. Um, so, but. I was willing to vote for it, so I'll move it. Thank you, Dwayne. Is there a second? I, thank you, Michelle. Yeah, I mean, my, you know, my comment before we vote again, which we already voted to pass it unanimously, is again, I mean- Not, not unanimously. David, David, uh, I've not said. I voted against. Right. You know, I, I mean, I have the same hesitations, but on the other hand, I mean, you know, you can't expect, I mean, it's, it's the air conditioning system and, you know, you can't expect anyone to, you know, be able to be there. And be, before we move anyone, we're talking a year or two. So and we're going into the summer. I assume that this would be something that would be installed now. Right. I, I think I, my suggestion is that we vote and hopefully agree to this. And we let Bernie talk to Dan and figure out if there's another option that makes sense. And if this is the most cost effective option that we've already allowed for. If there's a better option, we still have the opportunity to do that. Perfect. Mia, were you going to say? I'm sorry. Thanks, Eve. I Eve. I'm very comfortable with that. That's a great suggestion. Okay. All right. Now that we have properly moved and seconded the resolution, <laughs> <laughs> come on. It's only been six months. In six years, I'll get it. Or four years, or three years, or something. Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Nays. And David, that's a nay. Okay. So that's uh, five to one. And Dolores, you have that? Yes, thank you. No, thank you. Okay, uh, next one is 21201, resolution authorizing the award of a contract to VMG Group, V 
via the Mercer County Cooperative Contract Purchasing System for roof repairs at the municipal building located at 400 Witherspoon Street in the amount of $178,000. Michelle? I'll move that. Thank you. David, Thank you. second? We'll be holding on to that property, I think, for a while. Yeah. <laughs> I hope the so. foreseeable future. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <Now, laughs> questions on this resolution? All right. If no questions, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. That's everyone. Thank you. Um, Eve, did you want to speak to the next resolution before we move it, or once we move it? I wasn't sure which. Um, the uh, Princeton Senior. Don't have, I don't have strong feelings. Maybe we can introduce it, and then I will say my my piece okay that's fine uh, so i i move to well you can read it or i can read it as I'll go right prefer. ahead please go ahead right, right on the spot here uh resolution 21-202 resolution awarding agreement for extraordinary unspecified service to princeton senior resource center in the amount of one hundred and fifty five thousand three hundred and forty nine dollars for 2021 and I would like to move the resolution. Thank you. Michelle has the second. Okay. Questions, comments, Eve? Yeah, I did have uh, something I wanted to say. I also want to note that um, uh, Drew Dyson, the uh, Princeton Senior Resource Center uh, Executive Director is here. And um, uh, I, we don't need you, Drew, but if you want to come on when, when I'm done and just say uh, a few words, uh, that would be lovely. Um, so I just want to provide uh, some context for what Princeton spends on the PSRC as compared to what some other municipalities uh, spend. So, and, and this is information I, I uh, got from uh, Drew Dyson, again, the uh, PSRC executive director. Um, so I want to share what a couple of other towns in Mercer County spend on senior services. So Hamilton with a population of 87,000, spend $727,900. Robbinsville with a population of 15,600 spends $172,620. West Windsor with a population of 28,000 spends 262,286. Lawrence, population 32,000, spends $171,500. And Ewing, with a population of 36,000, spends $594,500. So Princeton is uh, the lowest of these. And uh, this figure does not include additional monies that are spent uh, for operations, buildings, and additional support service for the uh, senior center. Uh, in those communities. Um, those senior centers also provide far fewer programming opportunities than our senior center does, and none of them offer the social services support on staff that our senior center has offered, and especially throughout the pandemic, uh, the classes they've provided, the social work, the counseling. I think just Mia spoke to the loneliness of so many seniors. I think we all should you know, commend the work of the PSRC, just an extraordinary job and, and their vaccine, I can't remember what it was called, the vaccine service that they provided where they help people find uh, vaccines, just really, an incredible addition to our community, I think. And um, another issue that's come up is that a lot of the people who attend uh, classes, uh, whether during COVID or previously, don't live in the community. So I just wanted to address that a little bit. So uh, the PSRC's fundraising supports 82% of its operating costs. So the municipality is covering about 18%. And of that 82%, about half uh, is raised from outside of Princeton. These may be people who lived in Princeton and then moved out to Windrose and various other communities. But um, although the difference that the P PSRC charges 
to non-residents compared to residents is very small. I think it's important to note that non-residents provide a tremendous amount of the support that the PSRC gets, and those non-residents are covering the costs in part of the Princeton residents. So um, I really feel that uh, this is not a case where Princeton residents are, are carrying the burden of supporting people outside the community, but, but rather the uh, reverse. So I just wanted to get that information out there. And Drew, I guess if you want to say anything, uh, raise your hand and Adam can bring you on. And if you don't, then I just want to say you have our thanks. Drew. All right. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Eve and Mayor Frieda and the rest of council. I just want to express our appreciation for uh, the partnership that we've been able to form with the municipality. I especially want to thank Jeff Grosser and his team. We've done uh, incredible work together on the vaccine program, our vaccine navigator program. I'll send around a video that we just created on that. I'll send that to the mayor and the council to be able to see uh, the work of that program in the midst of uh, this past year. So again, I don't want to take too much time. I just want to say thank you and look forward to continuing the good work and the partnership that we have together. Thank you, Drew. Any other? Thank you, Drew. Any other council questions or comments? Okay, seeing that we have properly moved and seconded this one, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, that's unanimous. That's everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, 21203, resolution authorizing a home improvement contract to Windsor Hill Construction in the amount of $26,450. I'll move it uh, with a correction though. Um, um, uh, I should have, uh, sorry that I didn't catch this a little earlier, but I noticed uh, in the resolution, it keeps re referencing the Princeton Housing Board and the proper name should be the Princeton Affordable Housing Board. Um, I don't know if anyone else noticed that, but uh, so I'll move it with that correction. And um, I know Trishka is here, so you could confirm that that's okay just to correct the, the, the name of it. Yes, that's absolutely fine. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry, so Dwayne, you did move that, right? Uh, yeah, I moved it with the correction of the, uh, the name. Thank you very much. Eve, that's a second? A second, the corrected uh, resolution. Thank you, Dwayne, for catching that. Thank You're you. welcome, Eve. Any other questions or comments, uh, Michelle? Yeah, I, I just I wanted to clarify. So this is um, this goes towards the um, uh, our obligation and commitment to rehabbing and refurbishing our affordable housing units. So this is one out of the eighty, and I, I guess it comes from the affordable housing trust fund. Is that is that how that works? I, yeah, I it, it, it does. Yeah, Michelle, it does say in there. That this home improvement project will help satisfy Princeton's 80 unit housing rehabilitation component of its third round plan. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to confirm because it didn't specify a specific uh, development, but I, I guess we have other units scattered throughout town. So it's one of those units, yeah. which is great. Thank you. Good question. Any other questions or comments? Oh, wait a minute. Um... Okay, I just noticed something. So it should be, uh, wait a minute. Actually, actually, the correction was actually incorrect. It should be another, it should be Princeton Housing Authority, not Princeton Affordable Housing Board. I apologize. Right? Uh, no, no, or, or did I get it right the first time, Trishka? I'm a little, I'm confusing myself now. Trishka, I got it right the first time, right? Yes, we should. I, don't, I don't have the resolution in front of uh, me, so. But Dwayne, isn't this really coming out of our affordable housing? It's office? coming out of affordable housing board, is what I understood. So, so Michelle, right, but said the affordable housing, the affordable housing board can't actually spend our money. So, Maureen and our affordable housing office or our affordable housing program is uh, actually... affordable housing. But so something. So are we rehabbing the housing authority units? That's what I'm saying. We're not. That's what I'm saying. That's what there's some confusion. Confusion here. Uh, should we table this and, and just make sure it's corrected? Because the more yes. I look at it, there's there's more questions popping up in my head. There's I would recommend move it to your yeah. meeting on the 28th in that case. Yeah, yeah, because 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 I, I'm thinking it's one way when I first read it, and I thought there was an error. But then the more I think about it, there there are more questions that's popping up. Okay, but well, I, I would just in the agenda package on page 171. 
The Princeton Housing Board at its meeting on May 7, 2021, voted to recommend that Princeton approve the contract for okay. Windsorville construction in the amount of $26,450 for loan applicant 2021-1. Uh, because this amount exceeds the program cap of 20,000, the owner will execute a deferred loan from Princeton in the amount of 20,000 and will make a contribution of 6,400. $50 from their own. So it has to be the affordable housing board. They have to be Princeton affordable housing then. But um, so, for some reason, I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, I'm looking for, trying to find my notes, but I'm uh, right. So I think the wording is correct. It's the principal, it's the affordable housing program, which right. is a municipal function, right? But it has been reviewed and approved by the affordable, affordable housing, housing board. board. That's correct. Yes. Right. And, and I, because I understood it to be one of the units that are uh, owned, affordable. Right. So it has to be the Princeton Affordable Housing Board, right? Yes. Because it's coming from Maureen. Yes. So it could not be Housing Authority. Yes. Yeah. So no, I think it's correct. Right. I think it's so, correct. Right. It is. It's one right. of our. It's one of our existing affordable units. Right. Right. So, so but, but, so my initial correction is correct. So it, it should. It cannot be. It can't say Princeton. Housing board it has to be Princeton Affordable Housing Board. But Dwayne, I'm sorry, the memo from Maureen says the Princeton Housing Board. Right, right. So that Princeton should Housing be, Board is saying that should be Princeton Affordable Princeton Housing, housing board, board is officially called the Princeton Affordable Housing Board. Right. So in the, in the sixth, where in the sixth, whereas right in this resolution, we will correct the Princeton Housing Board to be the Princeton Affordable Housing Board. That is correct. And that is where the correction lies. There is another one as well, then the seventh as well, Mark. Correct, Whereas, thank you very much. Second sentence of the seventh. Two, right. Right. seventh right. right. So we're just gonna uh, insert affordable right. in there. Right. So the because there's no such thing as a Princeton Housing Board, it's a Princeton Affordable Housing right. Board. And, and so, then, I'm sorry, and then the, on the second page, a certified true copy shall be furnished to the principal affordable housing board. Yeah, number five. On we're going to make two. three. That's correct. We're going to insert affordable three times. Right. Okay. So what we're doing is right. correcting the name from Princeton Housing Board to the Princeton Affordable Housing Board in three spots in this resolution, which that's yes. just not a significant change. Right. Okay. We're still good to. We went around the mulberry bush, but we came back to the right place. <laughs> And in right. fact, the bush grew into a tree. In the <laughs> right. Then, then, then we yep. cleared it okay. up. Thanks. All right. So, so if, if I'm remembering correctly, Dwayne, you moved it. Moved it with the corrections yeah. of, of uh, amending the name from Princeton Housing Board to F Princeton Affordable Housing Board at, at the place it's stated. Right. And I'm sorry, who seconded that? Was that Eve? I think right? I may have. Or maybe, maybe Michelle, did you do Michelle? it? No, it was Eve. It was Eve. Right. Was Eve. Okay. Right. All right. Moved by Dwayne. Seconded by Eve. Discussed by all. <laughs> all in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. Thank you, David. Okay, that's unanimous. That's everyone. Thank you very much. Um, okay, the next number seven twenty one two oh four has been removed from the agenda as we agreed to at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, the next resolution is 21205, resolution commemorating Juneteenth of each year as an annual celebration of Black emancipation. Uh, I'll Letitia. move that also. With, oh, sorry. If, if I, oh, I'm sorry. Letitia may have beat me to it, but it needs a correction also. No, and actually, I wanted to point out that those corrections have been made on the okay. in the agenda packet, so the corrected version is on the uh, online. Okay, uh, so each became each, right? Yes. Okay. Good. Yes, and also there was another correction okay. that was pointed out, but that I wish to move it. But I also wanted to say that uh, Tommy Parker from the Civil Rights Commission. This was moved forward by the Civil Rights Commission, and he uh, he wishes to uh, speak on this. After I, there was oh, there, I think it. there was a second. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Dwayne. Okay, Leticia moved it. Dwayne seconded it, and we're gonna and. Adam, could you bring Tommy Parker into the meeting, please? Yes, Mayor.
Oh, I have to promote him to panelists to bring him in. Is that all right, Mayor? Yes, that's great. Thank you. Okay, there he is. Mr. Parker. Tommy. Time for a quote from a famous rock opera. Tommy, can you hear me? <laughs> <laughs> that was good, David. David. Go. Oh, I'm texting him to see if he's having difficulties. Okay, thank you, Leticia. Mm. Mm. If not, I think there are other members of the commission. If he can't, if he's having technical difficulties that might be able to speak on his place, in his place. Okay. Tommy, last shot, Lou. All right, Leticia, who else do, should we try uh, to Let me see if he's still here. Sherrod, Sherrod, if, uh, if Tommy can't uh, make it, could you say a few words about this resolution? And Sherrod Smith, uh, is the other member of the Civil Rights Commission. Okay. He's the Adam, vice I, I show him as the last person. On our list. There he is. You got it. Hi, Councilwoman Fraga. Thank you so much for inviting us to make some remarks here. Um, <clears throat> just want to first thank the council for giving us an opportunity to help draft this resolution. Um, we feel that's very important. We strongly encourage the community to rally support behind it. Um, we'd love the community to support uh, and recognize officially, finally, Juneteenth. Um, it's a big step uh, for the Civil Rights Commission. Um, it's a historic holiday that's solely being recognized, rightfully so, around the, throughout the country um, by municipal, municipalities throughout the country, as well as universities, in, to include Princeton University. So we thank you very much for considering the resolution. Uh, we tried to draft it as strongly as possible um, to recognize not only uh, the struggles, but also the triumphs, the bravery and courage that Black Princeton residents and, and Black Americans all throughout the country have shown uh, throughout the centuries. So thank you again for your consideration of this resolution, and we'd be happy to take any comments or, or questions. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Thank you, Sherrod. Okay. Are there any council questions or comments on the uh, resolution? I just want to make a quick comment. Um, yes, first sir. of all, I want to thank uh thank uh the civil rights uh but there's tommy CRC. oh tommy's here oh okay i'll i'll defer i'll let tommy speak first <laughs> okay tommy can you hear us oh no uh oh <laughs> tommy tommy mm. oh. I, I know he texted me that his uh that that his system crashed so sh dwayne perhaps at least he can listen then on, on your. Oh, okay. Uh, um, yeah, uh, when we talk about um, recognizing historic dates, uh, I know for some people, they act like dates are just like, it's like trivia pursuit. Okay, you understood that something happened. Uh, the reason why I think things like Juneteenth are extremely important is because, you know, as, as we talk about uh, um, uh, things like equity and, and and we want to make our country live up to its creed and, and to what the constitution is all about um we have to recognize that if if we don't recognize the struggles that people go through right then when we as like lawmakers are uh frame policy um I'll, I'll put it the other way when when we do recognize what people go through when we frame policy we can consider what the effects of the history are so we don't look at things just two dimensionally, like saying these things are just the way they are. We understand why they came to be. So when we study history, when we understand the why, it helps us to project into the future how they can be better, right? We see we see so many policies and 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 the negative effect of policies. Uh, you take and I'm I'm not going to hold us too long because I know it's getting late. But if you think of things like in the 80s, let's say the, the Reagan uh, war on drugs, right? And and you see how when certain drugs such as crack was decimating certain communities, how the attitude was like, oh, these people are just criminals, lock them up, right? 
without looking at what the issues were going on in these communities and trying to uh, understand the history of how these communities came to be and try to create policy to make things better. Therefore, we ended up with a lot of real uh, social issues, real fiscal issues like mass incarceration that, that we're facing now, right? But when we recognize history, we recognize how things came to be, looking at things more three-dimensionally, um, then it makes us look better at why our country is where it is and different facets of our country is where it is. Once we understand that, it makes us as policy, well, citizens in general, understand better how we move forward and make us as uh, policymakers understand how we uh, craft policies to actually live up to the, uh, the potential our country has. So that, that's my very long-winded way of saying that we have to really understand why things like uh, recognizing um, holidays like Juneteenth is important, not just for the African-American community, but important for, um, for all us Americans as a whole. Thanks. Thank you, Dwayne. Let's see you soon. Thank you for those words, Dwayne. And, and I, I just wanted to add that I want to commend the members of the Civil Rights Commission for really taking their time and drafting this resolution to make it something that is just not observing uh, in, in the, an honorary uh, you know, resolution that is just saying we observe it. They actually wanted to put um, stronger language on it, but also just uh, speaking on behalf of the Civil Rights Commission, I know that they're also working on other initiatives that are more significant to address uh, uh, past uh, wrongs, and uh, and it's something that uh, they'll be uh, hopefully in the near future uh, presenting to council uh, in more detail the work that uh, that some of the initiatives that they'll be recommended recommending for adoption. But thank you. Thank you. Any other council comments? Tommy just uh, posted in the chat that he. Uh, says, sorry, lost audio and, and uh, voice speak. Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right, well, Tommy, thanks for being here. Sorry that we couldn't actually hear you and listen to you this evening. Thank you. And I just, okay. I just uh, Michelle? I thank, thank you, uh, Leticia, and for your, your leadership in this and, um, you know, the, the CRC and what you've been doing. I mean, it's just, it's, it's great work and, and we really appreciate it. And, and Dwayne, thank you for your eloquent, uh, you know, historic perspective on this. Um, it's really important and really appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome, Michelle. Okay, Eve? I'm just gonna quote Dwayne and say what they said. So yeah, thank you <laughs> to all who, who put this, pushed this forward and made this a priority and such, you know, of course, perfect timing uh, right before mm -hmm. Juneteenth this coming Saturday. So yep. thank you. Okay, all in favor, please say aye. Uh, Aye. Aye. That's unanimous. Thank you very much. All right. The uh, consent agenda would be next and just the items on the consent agenda, paying our bills, uh, authorizing an alcoholic beverage license, authorizing a municipal auction, uh, second quarter uh, refunds for overpayments, and approving uh, two uh, new members of the fire department. Does someone want to... <laughs> We added a, a, a matter there. Oh, you're right. I'm terribly sorry. Forget it. Before we get to the consent agenda. Thanks, Bernie. Good catch. Let me read this one. Um, resolution authorizing the agreement between the municipality of Princeton and Gregory Whitehead of the Township of Lawrence to authorize, sign, and submit the Princeton 2020 Recycling Tonnage Grant to the Princeton, New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. Just another little paragraph. I'm just going to read the whole thing. Whereas the Department of Infrastructure and Operations recommends that the municipality of Princeton authorize Gregory Whitehead of the Township of Lawrence to authorize, sign, and submit the Princeton 2020 Recycling Tonnage Grant to New Jersey Department of Environmental, uh, Envir Environmental Protection. The uh, person that we were going to have on staff sign it, their certification <laughs> just ran out. So uh, we, uh, we need to ask Greg to, uh, to sign this for us. Thanks, Bernie. So, Eve? I say ran out as in left the municipality or is on as in expired. No, the certification, his certification. Oh, sorry. Okay. Not but him. He said expired. It was like he died. Okay. No, so no, sorry. Died. <laughs> but, okay. All right. All right. He's fine. He's fine. I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad to hear it. All right. Thank you. 
Greg Whitehead for coming yes. to our rescue. All right, so I'm sorry. Is someone moving that? David has it. Okay, he has the second. Any questions? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, that's everybody. That's unanimous. Thank you. All right, now we can do the consent agenda. And Michelle. Um, I have a, a, a comment about one of the items in the consent agenda. So can I move the consent agenda and mention the comment or should I pull it out? We should pull it out if we're going to talk about it. Okay, so then I would pull out the item on for auction. Um, okay, it's item number three, which is uh, resolution 21208. So okay. why don't we uh, why don't we talk about that first, and then we'll do the consent agenda. Okay, um, and my my comment about that is that I just want to be sure that we utilize the um, the enterprise fleet management contract as much as possible, and I'm concerned about not um, you know not pursuing that. I know that the very old vehicles don't make sense, but I do want to be sure that um, I just make. You know, I just wanted to highlight that and bring attention to that because it's really important um, that you know we worked um, for a couple of years um, on fleet management and, and David Cohen in particular, um, and you know council's direction was to um, utilize fleet management as much as possible. So I just want to be sure that when we look at auction, one of the selling points of, of doing an outsourced fleet management program was their ab ability to um, to leverage their resources and to be able to get the most for um, for our vehicles that we have. So I just want to point that out. That's it. Okay, thank you. David? Yeah, I'm just to flesh that out a little bit more. Um, one of the services that uh, uh, Enterprise offers is they have a, a guy who's an expert on the market for used vehicles nationwide and will do uh, an estimate of what our vehicles, the ones that we're looking to put on auction, what they're worth. Um, what we could get for them if we sold them through enterprise. And I think that it's a free service and you know we're really missing out on an opportunity if we don't at least ask them to take a look at this list of vehicles and give us that pricing. And then you know whether we go ahead with the auction because we think we can get as much and then we can analyze whether we're getting what we should from the vehicles at auction or whether we decide to take some of them and not sell them at auction because we can get more for them. Um, it, just, it just seems like uh, it makes sense to use that pre-service to make a decision about which vehicles to auction and which ones not to auction. Yeah, so uh, Bernie and I will go over, so we get Bernie up to speed on what, we, what the council voted on and agreed to what they agreed to do with Enterprise. So we'll make sure that it's clear what details we actually agreed to and what we did not. Um, but look at, looking at the list, there's a lot of pretty old vehicles and other assorted equipment. So, but we'll, again, I, as we did earlier, I'd suggest we approve it. Step, Bernie and appropriate staff will figure out the correct course of action. Okay, great. So, um, Michelle, did you want to move I'll, the- I'll move the consent agenda then. Oh, I'm sorry. We took we took this out. Of the I'll move the auction um, number three resolution. Um, I'll move that. Okay, so it's resol. I'm sorry, it's resolution. I'm just going to read it off again, so we're clear. Sorry, yeah. it's resolution twenty one two zero eight resolution authorizing municipal auction. So Michelle's going to move it. And is there a second? Eve has the second. Any other questions I, or comments? I, I I just want to make sure that if we vote on this, we're not actually locking ourselves into the exact list of equipment for auction that was attached to the resolution. Because I like to think we at least have flexibility to remove some of the vehicles from the auction if further uh, research indicates that's advisable. Mayor, um, a question that I have in regards to the resolution and for um, Gov deal, um, they were looking at having it be published in the newspaper that have the auction with Gov deal to begin June 28th. 
to July 6. Okay, so we so we have time to review the list. The administrator has time to review the list and determine what the final list will be. Yeah. I mean, since it's only a resolution, we can, uh, if, if, you know, look, if the mover and seconder want to say, we can change the resolution, or we can change what we're voting on to say, 21208 resolution authorizing municipal option, municipal auction upon review by the administrator and appropriate staff. I, I, yeah, I'm comfortable with that. I'm, I'm, I, I trust that it, there are some newer vehicles on here that really could should be explored. So I think that doing it that way would be great. So however you just said that. Yep, we'll make sure that's what's in the minutes as long as both you and the seconder agree. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, any other questions or comments? All right, seeing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, that's unanimous. That's everybody. All right, so now we're at the consent agenda. Eve? I actually have a question, which I don't know if uh, uh, Trishka can can answer uh, about the uh, or like, or maybe Michelle can about the liquor licenses. So should we pull that as well? Sorry. Yes, yeah, so but... if we're going to discuss it, we need to pull it okay, out. Okay, so 20, let's take 21207 out. And do you want to talk about that? first nope. you go ahead absolutely okay so um these fees seem incredibly low and i assume they're set by the state do we have any discretion to to raise these or again Don't we have to move and second it before you asked the question or am i wrong probably okay eve do you want to move this resolution i want to move uh 21207 uh, I'll thank you. It. And Dwayne seconded it. Thank you very much. Now, Eve, was your question about the Sorry. fees? And Trishko yes. is might possibly have already heard the question and might answer it. Uh, fees are typically set by ordinance. Uh, Dolores would know specifically as with respect to these fees, probably off the top of her head. But normally any fee that a municipality charges is set by ordinance. I don't know to what extent the specific amount of these particular fees, uh, you know, is discretionary or set by the state, but it's not they in the context of this, the they are set by the state, okay. Yes. But even if they weren't, in the context of this resolution, you would not be able to change them. Well, not at this point, but right. we could do so in the future if we had discretion, which we don't. So thank you, Dee, for answering that question. And Trishka for trying. <laughs> There you go. I, I knew that the clerk would have the correct answer. <laughs> Thank you, Dolores. Okay, it's a good question to ask, right? I mean, we should. Yeah. It's good. Okay, all in favor. I'm sorry, any other questions on the motion, on the resolution? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, that's everybody. That's unanimous. Okay, we're down to one, two, three. We're down to four items of the consent agenda. Anything else somebody want to take out, want to take out of the consent agenda? All right. If not, would someone move the consent agenda? Okay, I think David was the quickest, Eve was next. Any, no, yeah, we're good, there's no questions. All in favor of the consent agenda, there's four items, aye. please say aye. 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 Okay, that is the entire agenda. Would someone like to, thank you, David, makes a motion to adjourn, is there a second? Eve, thank you very much. Everybody that wants to vote aye, please raise a hand, wave, or say yes, or do something. Aye. Aye. All right, the meeting's adjourned. That's great. 9.08, two hours, roughly. Terrific. Yeah. All right, everybody. It may never happen again. <laughs> Don't Good. say that. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you all. Yeah. Good night. Night, night.